And we're back with some more RimWorld. And today we're going to be covering kill boxes and the three main rules that go into actually designing one. You don't have to build everyone the exact same way, but you follow the three main rules and you're good. Now the first two and the most obvious ones are provide cover for your pawns. You want your cover pawns to be in cover so that they are less likely to get shot by returning fire. The second one is you want to strip out all the cover for your enemies so that they have no cover and you're more likely to get off good shots on them, meaning you'll kill them faster. And thirdly, and this is the one that seems th it's the least obvious but is the most important, you want to be able to pour so much firepower downrange at the same time that the enemy cannot get into the box fast enough. You want them to file in, single file, one at a time, and as they come in, you should have enough firepower to kill them. Just, just stop them dead. And if you do that, they can never build up to the level where they can get up and attack your people. This here has slightly less firepower than is necessary, and as you can see, the Scythers are making it all the way to the front line and causing us damage. If this attack had have been bigger and it had continued, we would have been overwhelmed. So, we're going to start with number three first, and then we're going to move back to two and one, because I really do believe that number three is the most important and is what will kill you if you're not paying attention. One quick thing to note here is, I know some people have a, an aversion to using kill boxes. They'd consider kill boxes to be a waste of time, or to be against the game mechanics, and then there's the usual people who counter what mods you're using to make it doable, and I, I think if you're playing this game on vanilla difficulty and you're playing on the hardest difficulty setting, kill boxes are pretty much the only way you're going to survive them. If you want to use mods to avoid it, that's fine, but this is more of a guide towards vanilla survival. Now, this is the exact same attack as last time, except this time we've added in a few extra pawns here to help with the actual destruction. And as you can see here, this was still not perfect. If this was perfect, we'd maybe only lose one or two gun turrets. What had happened here is these gun turrets acted as distractions for these uh, scythers, so while they're busy wailing away on the gun turrets, your pawns get to riddle them down. You really want it so that you'd only lose a couple of gun turrets to distractions and only because it just took you that long to wipe them out. So the more firepower you can get into your kill box, the better. That should be your number one goal at the end. Now let's just cover some of the side goals and oh, we're going to have to cover the, the goal of protecting your pawns as much as possible, stripping out the cover for the enemies, and then finally what weapons you should use or target to use as best as you can depending on the enemies you're facing. So when it comes to designing your kill box, the first thing we're going to cover is cover. Uh, you've got granite barricades here. These are one of the preferred methods, but they're not the best. We've got dog's body over here. And what you can do is you can just grab the minigun, target your pawn on the opposite side of it, and you'll see that the cover will provide... This is 43% cover, and the barricade stops 57% of incoming projectiles. That should have hit. So shot by dog's body chance is 11%. However, we can improve upon that. Simplest way is wall segments. Now, walls... I've been a time-honored tradition for this. We'll just need some sort of target to shoot at. Oh, actually, before we do that, uh, you should note that the tighter, the, the more of an angle you have on something. So, for example, if we'd move this pawn just over here, this pawn now has a different angle on top of Anita. And what happens is it's actually passing over two of the barricades, so it changes the amount of cover they get. Now their ch chance to hit is 10%, but you can see the way there's two barricade stops listed there. So there's barricade stop 46 and barricade stop 23. That's just the combined chances that the bullets will hit the barricades instead of your pawn. So having having an angle is actually usually better for your cover, assuming you've got lots of cover to work with. If you're, say your pawn is standing over here on the edge and they've no cover to the right of them, then someone shooting from the right will have a bonus attacking them. Anyway, let's uh, throw in some wall segments here. Uh, targeting them behind a wall is a bit difficult, but I've set them to target that pawn over there with uh, the shield belts are white. And if we, that sort of makes them slide around so they can shoot around the pillar. And now if we try to target them with dog's body over there, you'll see that the chance to hit is 7.6% reduced from 10% because the wall that they're standing behind blocks 60% of projectiles. And to put that in cover, normally just the barricade was blocking about 43. So as well as that, the wall is stopping 60%, plus this barricade here is also blocking a percentage of the shots, 23%, which reduces the chances even further. Now what this normally results in is you'll have this pattern of walls, barricade, wall, barricade, wall, barricade, just so that your pawns have uh, the maximum amount of protection and you put your, your favourite pawns or your ones you want to die the least behind the wall segments and the ones that are directly behind the barricades are more likely to get hit, but usually they're the newer ones you don't care about as much or you just make your kill box bigger to begin with. But that's only the start of designing your kill box. Next up, you're going to want to decide on the size to the entrance to your kill box. Uh, the reason being here, we're working with a heavy submachine gun for, we'll go into reasons later as to why you might want to choose the heavy submachine gun as the size re prerequisite. You could use a heavy submachine gun range, or if you want, you could switch that weapon out. And instead you say the assault rifle, which has a much longer range, meaning you would have your entrance to the kill box back much further. But uh, for reasons that will become obvious later, we'll, we'll be sticking with the SMG. 
once you have set up your kill box or designed it this way, you're going to run into a problem. And that is, well, location, location, location. By that, I mean the location of your pawns in relation to the pillars can cause you to have problems with targeting. For example, this here is the radius of attack for this SMG. And while they can easily hit the targets right in front of them, no problems. Once they start going, oh, you'll see the way it's X'd out there. Uh, the reason being, once they've gone to about this direction, this they get cut off. Their angle of attack gets cut off by this wall segment. Which means this pawn, if you move them over here, can no longer target people entering the kill box. They can only target just to the right of them. Which means this is the maximum extent that you can use those wall segments out this way. Other, all the rest of these, people standing behind the pillars can't hit. However, you know, people standing behind right here, let's say these uh, sandbags, they can target no problems. So you need to make a few adjustments to make sure that you're getting the maximum amount of effect out of your pawns if you want to make sure they've employed the pillars continuously. And this is the result of, well, sliding the pillars sideways. What you do is you basically move the pillars up and one to the right. That way you have a, a better angle across here. At the same time, this still provides you very good cover. For example, there's 5.9% are the odds of them get landing a bullet on uh, Anita from that angle. And even someone standing here can still shoot back. They've still got a good line of attack. And at the same time, they're quite well defended. So their odds of getting shot are 9.1. Not as good as standing directly behind the pillar, but it's still better than standing out in the open. So as you can see, you can still keep doing this all the way for actually quite a distance. However, once you get to about here, things get a little bit odd. You can't keep continuing on with this same pattern. Uh, let me demonstrate here. Up until this point in the pattern, anyone standing along these areas can totally get a shot off on people entering. However, once you get to here and you go beyond the four tile mark, you end up being unable to get a bead. For example, you, this person can't shoot someone entering the kill box. They can only shoot there, but they can't shoot the person entering, which means, well, that's pointless. We can't have that. So we need to make a few minor modifications here to make sure that we can continue to shoot and provide cover. This is the resulting change. Now you can have people still tucked in behind here. They can get a shot off. And at the same time, they're still well protected from returning fire. This is why you'll see on many of the kill boxes, they've got these sort of curved fronts to them. Now, simplest way to remember this is you want, this is the center tile here that faces the kill box. You want about four to the right. This is assuming you're running on the SMG style uh, distances. Four tiles to the right of center, then four tiles go up at, you know, one tile up a piece or one block up a piece. And then you want three running just on the normal. And this will allow you to, well, three running at this angle. Then once that's done, you still have like, an enormous amount of cover and a huge amount of space to chuck in your pawns. Now you just got to repeat that exact same design the other side. This here is a stupidly oversized kill box. Now this is just taken to the absolute maximum extreme just based on the criteria of protecting your pawns as best as possible while still allowing them to return fire to the point in here. There's also this area up here that is not as well protected that just has some granite barricades. This is normally reserved for close combat units, usually ones that have a shield belt. They can sit up front and enemies entering the kill box are more likely to target them over anything else. And because they've got shield belts, they're less likely to take any damage. Uh, you're also going to want to put in some fire foam poppers and things like that. But let's just have a, a quick test of this first by summoning ourselves in some tribals to have a, a shooting range at. First thing to note is you'll, you'll see that all of these are just crammed in there. This is one of the bugs of the game. When the enemies are just passing from one location to another, they can bunch up like this. The only time they'll pop out of this is if they get turned into combat units. For example, do you know when you are, have your people walking along doing their jobs, they can overlap. But the moment you click uh, toggle the military draft, they then pop out of the way. That's normally why you have this big, long snake. This snake serves two purposes. One, it causes them to... Well, oh yeah, they're starting to pop out now. One, it takes longer for them to get all the way through, which means you have plenty of time to get your people into position for defense boost. At the same time, it also causes this bug where they sort of... Yeah, they all start popping out of each other, which means they enter your kill box one at a time, which as we covered is very, very important. So long as they enter one at a time, you're far safer and you can hopefully kill them faster than they can get into the box. Currently down here, we have what? 13 humans all armed with submachine guns. Uh, what did I give them as uh, submachine guns, by the way? Is it just regular ones? Yeah, normal SMGs. So we'll have a quick run through with normal SMGs and then we'll crank up the weapons just to see what happens when you have a better weaponry to deal with because I'm pretty sure they're about to get overrun. All right, well, they're entering the kill box now that the game is still lagging out like crazy. It's trying to do the collision physics on this and it's just, yeah, it's, it's not going very well. Oh, and a deer wandered in as well. All right, we'll skip this forward a bit. I'm expecting them to get overrun after about uh, a few minutes. Oh, that it brings up another point. Uh, normally what I do is uh, these areas in here, I would fill them with turrets. As in these suckers here, I would stick in turrets in all these sections. But I would not put in sandbags. These sandbags were put in here just for testing purposes to for targeting location information. So you could see where you could hit anything. The reason I don't put in sandbags is what will happen is you'll find that pawns will enter in here and then hide behind the sandbags. Once the turret is destroyed, they'll 
hop in here to use that for cover. You do not want them having any cover whatsoever. Oh, I forgot to close that door, didn't I? If they have any cover whatsoever, it's reducing, it, it increases the amount of time it takes for you to destroy them, which means more pawns or more enemies can enter the kill box. You want to make sure that they have absolutely zero cover. This would be more like what the kill box would look like, with all of these areas full of turrets as well if I had the resources available, though it may be a while before you can afford to put that many turrets around everywhere. The uh, reason for the sandbags all the way up and out, well, pawns cannot stop standing on, stand, uh, standing on the sandbags. If we didn't have these sandbags here, the first pawn would come to the corner, stop there and start shooting around the corner at our people. We, we don't want them doing that. So instead, we force them that they get to the corner, they have to keep walking until they get off the sandbags. And once they're off the sandbags, there's no cover. There is nothing but open ground and lots of waiting submachine gun fire. I'm actually a little surprised that just that many submachine guns were able to take care of it. They're only normal submachine guns, though. I suppose Anita is a bit of a beast. I cloned Anita a bunch of times just to make this faster. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, 13 Anitas with 16 shooting and a bunch of normal SMGs will effectively kill an infinite number of tribals. It doesn't matter how long they kept coming, they were all going to end up dead. However, this does result in other problems. As you'll notice here, the walls have gotten chewed away. This is going to become more and more of a problem. The longer the game goes on, the wealthier you become, and the larger the raids become, and the more dangers you face. It just, you are going to start chewing away your kill box, which normally results in a slight modification to this design. There we go. What we've done is, well, these walls were originally made of granite. Granite is the toughest material you could use in terms of just regular stone. Uh, stone you can mine out of the ground. Plasteel, however, has been, it's received quite a major buff recently in that it's no longer flammable. And because it's no longer flammable and it is the highest hit point with 840 of any of the walls, it's actually viable to use as a wall segment. It's only 510 points for granite. So that, that quite decent bonus is, is quite worthwhile if you can afford the plasteel. Uh, Plasteel is actually not that hard to get late game, but uh, early game, this will probably not be affordable. Stick with granite if you get your hands on it. Uh, so that is, that's the basics of forcing the, the tribals in, getting them to spread out, and then forcing them to only come in one at a time so that you can basically out DPS them down. However, tribals are not the only thing you're going to face. You're going to end up facing pirates, and pirates are a lot tougher. They're going to be wearing more armor and less cloth. So you're probably going to want to well, have slightly better weaponry. So let's what, get all of these and let's upgrade their weaponry style, shall we? Well, this is a little embarrassing. I summoned a pirate raid and 90 of them showed up, but all of them are equipped with sniper rifles. As you can imagine, this is not going to be a very effective weapon in a kill box designed for SMGs. I'm going to call that perfectly fair. Perfectly fair, though it may not be a completely accurate test of the exact mm, potential of the kill box. Anyway, uh, all of these people have been upgraded slightly. Uh, by slightly, I mean they've all been given Masterwork SMGs. Now, one of the reasons I use SMGs is they just have... Well, I did some weapons testing recently, and SMGs just turned out to be very, very good for, for weak shooters all the way up to decent shooters. And I'll go more into details on them later, but for now, let's... Uh, oh, the pirates are starting to spread out. Collision mechanics, wonderful. Uh, we'll just uh, fast forward this and see how they do against this many pirates. The difficulty here is going to be DPSing them down when they're all equipped with flak vests, flak pants, and basically a lot heavier armor, which means it should take an awful lot more damage to knock them all over. And that right there is an example of why I would advise you to spend all of your inspirations on improved weaponry. Just a, a few masterwork... A, a masterwork weapon is amazingly powerful. Uh, how can I explain this? Uh, in the weapons testing we did, if you had, say, a Masterwork SMG, it would be more powerful than an excellent charge rifle. And charge rifles, and this is against centipedes, the be-all, end-all of a kill box is to stop mechanoid raids. They're the ones that will kill you most often, which is what we'll be covering next. In fact, let's just fire that up now so we're, we get started. And starting off here, we have... 12 various? No, that's not what we were looking for. We were looking for 13 lancers, 11 scythers, 7 pikemen, and 14 centipedes, which is a pretty decent sized mechanoid attack force. Now, I haven't had Barracuda to pop out and start shooting them yet. Uh, the reason being, usually you've got a decent enough chance of taking down these scythers without EMPs, and if you open up those doors, Barracuda will probably end up dead. So let's just leave the door closed until we're through with all the, uh, the initial chaff, and then we'll get through to the centipedes, which are the real meat of the attacks. This is what will kill your base nine times out of ten once you survive the early game. This is why we spend so much time building kill boxes, is so that we can kill these centipedes. Now, now that that's done, we can open these doors, hop back behind there, grab your grenade, and I'll have you EMP right about there. 
They're just gonna keep throwing grenades. That's their, all they're gonna do from now on and keep stunning them there. And then as they come out, they will get shot. Now, if you want to micromanage a bit, a good idea is to find the ones that have the fire... Where is it? The incendiary launchers. Uh, this one here, yep. These ones here, if you're going to micromanage it, find those, shoot those first. The reason being, if they get a shot off and set some of your people on fire, your people will run around, and while they're running around, they're not shooting. And while they're not shooting, they're wasting DPS, which makes it takes you longer and longer to kill them. Now, nope, there we go. Someone went on fire. Oh, yeah, Anita. Kind of obvious. Uh, get back into formation. And there you go. Bearing in mind, this is all just with 13 people armed with Masterworks SMGs. Boom. Problem solved. Eh. Get those back to work. Just a, a few more details on this. I'll put up a picture of this uh, attached in the description if you want a picture because it's easier to replicate things when you have a picture to work from. You don't need to have it this big depending on how many pawns you're acquiring. If you're going with Randy Random, you can have up to 50 pawns before the AI gets a bit crazy. But if you're playing Cassandra, let's say, she starts to wig out when you go above 16. So you might want to, say, cut down the edges of this. Having this really long, it's a good idea. Um, you're probably going to want to put in some doors for easier access in spots. But where you put them is up to you. This is a kill box I made earlier. It's a smaller, more compact version and less ridiculous as the other one. And this is back. This is about the time you've got enough spare components to be throwing in steel mini turrets, tactics, distractions. But the main takeaway here is let's go over to the weapon section on the machining table. This is what it costs to produce all of these weapons. A heavy SMG is four components and 75 steel. Compared with an assault rifle, which does less damage until you get up to, well, it... it the assault rifle has more range than the SMG, but will do less damage with weaker shooters who have weaker shooting skill. Once the shooters get up to very high levels, say level 15 or 16, and maybe have some advances like a bionic eye or two, then they'll catch up with the SMG. However, yeah, it costs you seven components and 60 steel, and SMGs are quite low down on the tech tree. Uh, LMGs just don't build them. Yeah, there's a reason they only cost five components and 75 steel. They're literally worse than the assault rifle. You'd think they're a better version of the assault rifle. The LMG is a misleading name. It's it it The LMG and SMG labels in this are, are really weird. Uh, if I think of SMG, I think of uh, a small light machine gun that fires uh, pistol rounds. But the as compared to, say, an assault rifle, which would carry, you know, assault rifle rounds. However, the SMG does more damage per round than the assault rifle, so I, I think SMG is sort of a misleading term. It's more of a heavy caliber bullet that does a little bit more damage, it, it, but is shorter range. I, I don't know exactly how to describe it. The minigun, however, oh god. Minigun costs 20 components and 160 steel. Don't get me wrong, miniguns are actually really, really good. It's just the cost of making them. Yeah, unless you get them from a quest, you're not going to have them early on. And finally, you've got the charge rifles, or the, the absolute bell of the ball is the charge rifle. These things are amazing, and if you can get your hands on some, some good ones, do so. However, they cost 50 plasteel and two advanced components to make, require a minimum crafting skill of seven, and take 750 work amount. They take a long time to make. They're really expensive, but they are very, very good. And later on, if you have access to them and you can build them and you have an inspiration, I would probably throw it into a charge rifle. Uh, one Another note here, when it comes down to just adding on the size of your kill box, the reason I chose the SMG is it's just its cost efficientness is amazing and you can really get up to a very good strong fighting force and take out huge quantities of enemies, assuming you can control the, the fighting environment. So just make sure that you can uh, at least get your pawns in range. As well as that, if you do get drop potted in or things like that, they can rush in and do quite a good job. The, the DPS on SMGs is quite good. A few closing notes on this. Well, quite a few closing notes on this. One, uh, make sure you keep the area inside your kill box clean, but don't actually floor it. If you floor it, it increases the movement speed of the enemy, so the enemies can actually gain close distance with you faster. If, you're, if you've got enough DPS, go for it, then you, you definitely can stop them from closing with your people. That's great. Uh, two, there is ways to cook pawns, but I'm not going to cover that. That's a whole separate tutorial because it's uh, it's very difficult to arrange just quite well. Uh, chain shotguns are very, very powerful. They're one of the best weapons in the game for DPS. The problem is that you can't really make a very large kill box out of them. Uh, for example, on this kill box over here, we've only been using, yeah, 13 pawns. But if I hadn't have been so lazy, I would have organized them in this way. This way, all of them have the maximum amount of cover available. That's one of the reasons to make your kill box bigger than you need it, so that you don't have, you're not forced to put people in between in these in-between spots where they're more likely to get hit. This just reduces the chances of those people getting shot. One of the reasons we choose the SMG when it comes to this sort of setup, this here is a list of every weapon and they're sorted by range. This is the heavy SMG. Everything below this is weapons with shorter ranges. Well, actually the short bow draws it for range. So a machine pistol, peel a pump shotgun, chain shotgun, EMP grenades and the Molotovs. 
So if you have any weapon that you pick up, because let's face it, you're not going to have a chance to get all Masterwork SMGs, what will usually happen is you'll get quests or something along the way that will give you a, a, a better than average weapon. If you get any weapon with a range of 22.9 or above, you can just slot it into your kill box. Because any weapon that's Masterwork or Legendary is going to be better than any other weapon that's not. By and large. Uh, pistols and revolvers, not so much, let's say. But any of the uh, the big weapons. This is the five main weapons you're probably going to get a chance to use in your kill box in order of best to worst charge rifle, then minigun, then SM heavy SMG, then assault rifle, then LMG. Uh, that's based on uh, normal or better. Once they hit excellent, that's fine. But once they hit, uh, was it masterwork? If you get a masterwork of any of these, it is superior to anything that is not a masterwork. If you get a legendary of any of these, which is one level above Masterwork, that will be superior to any other gun in this row that's not legendary itself. So if you do pick up any legendary weapons, just use them. Doesn't matter if it's an LMG, assault rifle, anything, just you will have to use it. When it comes to the miniguns, they do slow down the movement of your pawn. So what you can do is set a setup like this, where you keep a bunch of weapons close by. This is usually a weapons cache with some doomsdays and triples. I don't think I needed the triples, to be honest, but uh, also EMP grenades, which you're going to leave nearby to your kill box so that you can EMP down centipedes when they show up. At the same time, throw down a small dining area, well, or a large dining area, depending on the size of your base, right beside your kill box. This allows your pawns to run out, grab food, and top up in between fights. It may happen that you have to fight multiple fights at the same time, or it could just be that they're hungry at the start of the fight. Fights can come at any time. Having a meals nearby that they can grab in an absolutely excellent dining area means that what happens is they get a full bonus from it as opposed to just eating a meal out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, at the same time, put down fire foam poppers. These are absolutely essential because centipedes that throw out those incendiary cannons will cause you too many problems. Uh, at the same time, do keep some drugs nearby, namely wake up, beer, psychite tea, things like that. What'll happen is uh, just in case your pawns do run out of, well, what'll happen is they'll run out of rest, they'll run out of food, they'll be getting close to mental breaks. Send them back to grab a meal, dose them up with some wake-up, and the next thing you know, they're fully rested, fed, and they're not going to do mental break anymore. Because mental breaks are usually what kills them, because they'll wander out here and decide, oh, I'm just going to stop here and have a snack in the middle of a centipede attack. <clears throat> to, not that I'm speaking from experience, of course. Anyway, uh, next thing to remember is inspirations. Burn them all on weapons. It's just... Mm. Research-wise, for example, if you look inside here, you can get blowback operation. Blowback operation... Wait, no. Ah, gas operation. Gas operation gives you access to chain shotguns, heavy SMGs, and LMGs. Heavy SMGs being the cheapest and being one of the most cost-efficient guns, you might as well burn your inspirations on them, considering you can get your hands on them quite quickly. Uh, you have to go up to precision rifle to get assault rifles, um, and they're not really worth it. Miniguns, totally worth it. It's just that they're expensive, more expensive to get and harder to get your hands on, uh, unless you're going all the way up to, where is it? Oh, yeah, pulse-charged ammunition. Yeah, charge, charge lances and charge rifles. They're much, much further away. At the same time, the only other thing I would really spend my uh, my inspirations on would probably be armor, and that would come down to complex clothing and dusters. A thrombo for duster with a masterwork or legendary thrombo for duster, it gives amazing protection. So until I get my hands on the technology to make SMGs, I would probably burn the inspiration on dusters. But after that, yeah, probably all SMGs. The faster you can kill something, the better. If I had, for example, armored all of these people in legendary armor, but give them normal uh, normal SMGs, it would have taken them so much longer to kill the centipedes. The centipedes would have got off more shots and those shots would end up damaging the armor and eventually the armor will degrade. Also, if your pawns get into fist fights, that's going to degrade the armor. Any kind of hits on the armor is going to degrade it, and eventually you will have to toss it once it's 51% and they start getting the debuff. Weapons, on the other hand, 1%, 100%, it doesn't matter. The weapon will work absolutely the exact same all the way from 1% to 100%. So just burn your inspirations in the SMG, and the first SMG you, you make will be with you from the start of the game to the end, well, unless everyone burns an unholy fire, which, you know, occasionally happens. When you're designing your kill box, just remember the three main rules and you can you can design it any size or shape you want depending on what weapons you want to prefer to use. Just remember, maximize the cover for your pawns, minimize the amount of cover for your enemies, and make sure that you can bring as much firepower to bear as possible on the center where they're going to enter. Uh, don't forget to reinforce your kill box because you will start chewing through it once you start dealing with the tougher enemies. Oh, and especially when you start using miniguns and charge rifles. Miniguns have area of effect. You're going to shred this whole area to confetti. Put in your little side area here. I forgot to mention that. You're going to need your little side area here for your EMP grenadiers. I usually have space for two. Just in case one goes down, that would be bad. If you lose both your EMP grenadiers and you stop being able to grenade the people, the centipedes there, you're probably going to be in an awful lot of trouble. That's why I usually leave the space for two. Don't bother with the EMP launchers or any of the other EMP technologies. The reason being, they just, they're not as accurate or they just have smaller blast radiuses. The EMP grenades fires faster and has a larger blast radius. It just allows you to get more done with less pawn. And that's really what you want. You want to have as few pawns as possible as it takes to hit that critical mass of killing everything just as it enters the kill box. 
if we had to say double, doubled up on the amount of people here, we probably could have slaughtered those centipedes and barely taken any return fire. Anyway, that is uh, the main rules of building a killbox. I hope you enjoyed and uh, good luck. Mm-hmm.